be with you and thank you for joining me for yet another podcast this Sunday this January 16th is the second Sunday after Epiphany and Epiphany is that season of where that that celebrates how light has come to the world that the light has come to the world the light being Jesus Jesus presence is here among us it's one of the greatest realizations and revelations that as believers we can come to is knowing that Jesus is ever and always with us and sometimes it's in mysterious and strange ways and sometimes it's in obvious ways, and sometimes it's in ways in which we, we wouldn't perceive or, under, or, or recognize. Sometimes Jesus comes to us, visits us, ministers to us through his spirit that is within another individual, be it a family member or a friend. There is an array of different ways. Prayer, prayer is a big one. And in these days, prayer is, is so essential for us. It, it has to be a foundation for us where we need to be praying uh, for ourselves, for one another, and just seeking the presence of God, seeking the Spirit's direction in days like this. Um, we are we are in interesting times, and I've, uh, how many times have we said that one over and over again through the past two years? But there seems to be a higher level of frustration and and uh, disappointment with the latest restrictions that have come down, and I'm not here to to question them, to question them, or to to pre stir the pot on them, but just to acknowledge, fully acknowledge that there is some frustration. There is this, this yearning to get past this, this yearning for better days. And I think the wonder of the Bible, the wonder of the scriptures that, and the promises of God is that better days are always on the way. And it doesn't always mean ease and comfort come with it, but that God is with us in the presence of good times and during times where there is an absence of ease and comfort that God is with us and God ministers to us in ways that are obvious sometimes in ways that are not and being receptive to his spirit by spending that time in prayer becoming familiar with the voice of God that will mean so much that is like an epiphany will happen a realization that hey it's not so bad I'm okay God is with me God is with us and so that is what this this podcast is about it is talking about better days because of the presence of God and because of the life of abundance that he has given to us I also want to thank uh, so many of you who have been bringing in prayer requests if you look to the attachment that came along with the email to accompany uh, well, the uh, the Christ Lutheran weekly uh, lots of interesting things have taken place I, I'm I have to kind of limit what I say virtually here because it goes so public but Brent and Courtney having their baby girl is is really a wonderful thing. And also some of you who have submitted uh, some prayer requests um, on behalf of others that, that, that you are aware of, recognizing that there is uh, that, it, that there's something about having a church come together and praying for people whom they know or may not know. It's a wonderful thing. So keep praying for one another. And we will stay atop of some of the, uh, of the announcements and, and the latest developments regarding uh, the pandemic and, and where that may lead us in the days to come when it comes to in-person services and regular church activities again. But God bless you. I hope you enjoy this. And God has given you life in abundance. And, uh, what, a re and what a reason to rejoice and be glad. God bless you. Stories of the Bible. Jesus turns water into wine. 
This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Jesus was born in Bethlehem and grew up in Nazareth, where he grew in wisdom and favor with God oh, I see. and man. One day, Jesus, his disciples, and his mother went to a wedding in Cana. In the middle of the party, the wine ran out. Uh-oh. So Jesus' mother, Mary, told him, they have no more wine. Ah. Jesus replied, dear woman, that's not our problem. My time has not yet come. Excuse me. But Mary told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars. The Jews used jars like these in their washing ceremony. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. Yeah, okay. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants did what Jesus told them to. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign in Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Our Old Testament reading comes from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 through 5. Because I love Zion, I will not keep silent. Because my heart yearns for Jerusalem, I cannot remain silent. I will not stop praying for her until her righteousness shines like the dawn and her salvation blazes like a burning torch. The nations will see your righteousness. World leaders will be blinded by your glory, and you will be given a new name by the Lord's own mouth. The Lord will hold you in his hand for all to see, a splendid crown in the hand of God. Never again will you be called the forsaken city or the desolate land. Your new name will be the city of God's delight and the bride of God. For the Lord delights in you and will claim you as his bride. Your children will commit themselves to you, O Jerusalem, just as a young man commits himself to his bride. Then God will rejoice over you as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. Our New Testament reading comes from the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 11. Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And someone else, the one Spirit, gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. And our Gospel reading comes from the book of John. John chapter 2 verses 1 through 11. The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, They have no more wine. 
Dear woman, that is not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, Fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, Now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though, of course, the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then everyone has had a lot, when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Isaiah 62 verses 1 through 5. That was our Old Testament reading that you just heard moments ago. And it speaks, these words, they speak of a promise, a promise for better days that were on the way for the people of the day to whom Isaiah was speaking to. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of what made Isaiah's day difficult and trying, as I usually try and do when expounding from some of these Old Testament passages. The situation, though, the situation is similar to many other Old Testament passages that speak of better days that were on the way. And often it was a prophet who would bring these words of hope to the people, good news um, of better days. And these prophets, they lived in different eras. Sometimes their tenure, though, would overlap with one another where they existed simultaneously through a certain moment in history. But often they did not. But they shared something in common. They all did. And what they shared in common was generally it was oppression. Uh, they lived with people and among people, sharing the identity of powerless victims, being subjected to abuse from larger nations or regimes that were carrying the biggest stick of their respective times or their respective reigns. And so good news needed to be declared and needed to be heard. And there always was good news to be declared and heard. Where hope could be had and even realized um, in certain ways during some of these darkest of moments. And history, history is filled with moments such as that, where that some people who live through such difficult and dark moments uh, at various different times of and it left them longing for something. It left them longing for better days. Yeah, history is filled with such moments. And I like history. And lately, I have, over the past few years, I've been reading books from the past. Not that far in the past, but from the past still. Books by C.S. Lewis and Thomas Merton from the 1950s and 60s. I'm captivated by authors such as these. I'm captivated by how they articulated their faith, both of them within a context of the post-World War II era. Now, that moment in history, is we're not that far removed from it. It's not, it hasn't even been 100 years that it has passed. But how many people lived through that horrific time, were so despaired from what they were seeing happening around them? How many were pierced in their souls by the treatment of humanity in that time? The attempt to exterminate the Jewish people, the imprisonment or execution of those who sought to try and provide refuge for Jewish people in that time. Such an excessive loss of life during that time. And World War II was only, what, 20 years removed from World War I? And how many Christian people were believing that they were living in the very end of days? And oh, how they would have been longing for better days. Well, going back even further than that, there has been this constant fight for human rights for all people in the, in the U.S., years of segregation and a mindset of elitism where some saw a difference in race, where one race was more superior than another. So it was thought, that whole black versus white issue. And the, the human treatment through those years, through those hundred years or so, it was so deplorable. And sadly, this is an issue that still exists today and not only in the U.S. It exists here in our country as well. And just recently, I saw a program about the Salem witch trials in the late 1600s. So many people, many women who lost their lives being accused of 
being a witch, many falsely accuse having nothing to do with the occult at all. But mass hysteria, absent of a filter for fear, will unleash a hatred that nearly always leads to violence and death. I could carry on example after example, drawing on moments from history that date as far back as Genesis itself. Moments that were dark, where people were longing for better days. And, and it makes me shudder over what some people from the past have had to endure, what they've had to go through. Now, I don't like to talk about COVID very much. I just feel that it's in our face constantly and that there are much better things to talk about in a podcast such as this or when we come to church and so forth. Sometimes it's unavoidable, though. But, and, and it's all been very confusing, hasn't it? A confusing time, and it's been frustrating. And I think that perhaps even things have been said and done by leaders and everyday citizens, everyday citizens, by perhaps even by our, by our own selves, where things have been said and maybe done that are, are now regrettable. And how many people, too, also have, have declared that our current moment, this, this particular moment right now, is uh, is the beginning of the end that it is that armageddon is right on the doorstep beginning with issues such as uh as the loss of human rights and maybe that's so maybe maybe not but without question uh, it's been very challenging and human rights is something that we always want to protect we always want to keep watch over to and, and i don't want to minimize some of those things that are concerns to us but this moment though this moment in time in my mind is not is not on the same plane as what others have gone through and had to live through. And it's not to say that things will not grow, perhaps to even a worsened state than what they are now. They could, but I shudder at the thought of having to live through some of the horrific things, some of the horrific moments from the past, as others have had to do. And yet, even now, there is one thing that I share with others from different times and eras that I still, that I, I think I feel along with them, within my own context, of course, and even though I have not suffered, as others have had to suffer from different eras, one thing that I think we share is that we long for better days. We both, we all do. I, I really believe this. Isaiah 62 says, I will not keep silent. What does that mean, I will not keep silent? I think it means that with better days, the good news of better days that are on the way, if you believe that because Jesus is your Lord, well, then don't keep silent about it. Call out for righteousness. And how does anyone call out for righteousness? What does that look like? Well, in ancient times, the call for righteousness often came in the form of an announcement made by a prophet such as Isaiah, announcing on behalf of God to have hope, that there was good news for all people to embrace. But not everyone was or is a prophet, so how would those who will hear this proclamation become a part of this calling out for righteousness? Well, by not remaining silent. And let's not confuse this with proselytizing either. What good is that if not accompanied by genuine, legitimate, and a sincere living out of faith that believes better days are on the way? Because that belief is founded in a deep confidence that is simply and only because God said so and living out faith and righteousness is anything but silent. What kind of voice do people have? We do have a voice, and it's almost kind of humbling to think that we have a part in this call toward righteousness. The thing is, is who feels equipped or adequate enough to join in being a voice that we often assume is more reserved toward those who have a role of theologian or a Bible scholar or a pastor or those people of that like. But you know what? Erase all of those vocational lines. We all have the same Holy Spirit available to us. We all have the same spirit. And last week's gospel was of John, John and, and where John was baptizing Jesus by the Jordan River. And what was seen descending down upon Jesus when he was in the river and while he was praying was something that looked like a dove that had descended down upon him. And it was the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. And that same spirit that descended upon Jesus is the same spirit that we are given as a gift from God when we ask. 1 Corinthians 12, our New Testament reading, it's, it tells us this. It tells us that the Spirit gives you a voice that matters and that is heard. A voice that breaks through the silence by allowing the Holy Spirit to work in you and flow out from you. We're given gifts. 
And when those gifts are used, they become evident and become a voice that joins in this call for righteousness through allowing the love of God to flow out from yourself toward another who either needs or is without the love of God. And it brings us to the realization that as challenged or bleak a certain day or age may be, better days are always a very real hope to embrace because his spirit, the spirit of Jesus, is not only with us, but within us. And what's dark and dreary then no longer has such a fearful hold. Our oldest son is getting married. And so we are in the process of transferring custody of him over to his fiance. And it's going to be a summer wedding and we are already looking forward to it. And of course, we're hoping that the world is gonna be a different place at that time uh, where there's a little less anxiety and a little less stress and a little more openness to, that would give a little more freedom uh, so that these celebrations can allow for more people to share in them and to participate in them. Because there's something about wedding celebrations that, that, are, that is so endearing. Young love, you know, and, and then they're sharing that kinship with friends and family, just being together and celebrating together, coming together and joining in what is really a festive spirit in, in these wedding banquets, these wedding celebrations. And I think wedding celebrations throughout the ages, as I see them and even read of them in the Bible, were just that. They had all of that in common, that they were festive times. Now, there was one grand wedding that happened 2,000 years ago, a little better than 2,000 years ago, at a place called Cana. And John chapter 2 records that in verses 1 through 11. And a miracle happened there. And it was a miracle that was performed by Jesus. And when we think of Jesus' miracles, it's the miracles where those who were in desperate situations that come to mind. You know, people who were needing food, maybe, who they, that were hungry, um, people who, who were perhaps had a physical issue, whether it was blindness or they were deaf or whether they were lame or maybe even a demonic issue. The, there were even miracles where one was where people would be raised from the dead. And these miracles, they're acts that relieve suffering and restore life and health and, and wholeness. So it's a little bit of a surprise, I think that the first miracle that John records in his gospel is one that almost is kind of, well, frivolous. And there isn't a desperate person that's involved here. There, well, there is a desperate person, but not in a life-threatening way. And there's no crisis of hunger or illness. Rather, the crisis, what it is, is a depletion in the amount of wine. The wine is running out. And that was posing a threat to maybe cutting the wedding celebration short, maybe, but it certainly, it didn't pose any immediate threat or any immediate danger to anyone's health or life. It's actually a funny story. Jesus' mother recognizes the wine is running out and that it would be a considerable embarrassment to the hosts, uh, who are likely the parents of the wedding couple. And her heart goes out to them. But she has a son. And she has a son who is special, and she goes to him and fills Jesus in on the predicament. And Jesus' response to the dilemma seems very unconcerned, as if to dismiss it altogether as being a non-issue. And you know what? Perhaps it was. And Jesus, he says to his mother, and I'm paraphrasing here, Mother, what does any of this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His hour has not yet come, referring to his death, resurrection, and ascension to the Father. And certainly, Jesus did have more important things to do than fix the wine shortage, I'm sure of that. But his mother didn't share that same sentiment, nor does she speak a word of rebuttal to Jesus' response. What she does is all, it's almost comedic here. She simply looked to the servants and spoke to them. You do whatever he tells you to do. And with that, she may have had a quick glance at Jesus and then walks away, fully confident that her son will do something about the issue at hand. And we know how the story goes. Jesus asks for six jars to be filled with water and then turns the water into the finest of wine. And the MC, the master of ceremonies, he's really impressed. Everyone is happy. The party carries on and, and, and it's not cut short. And the hosts, they're spared of embarrassment. There's a happy mother. Jesus' mom is happy. And the servants who were there to assist, well, they're, they're astounded by what took place. So why such an extravagant miracle? And you know what, the author, John, he, he doesn't really call Jesus, Jesus is turning water into wine a miracle. It's a miracle for sure because it's a supernatural act. But 
but John refers to this as a sign. And maybe the use of the word sign in place of the word miracle is just splitting hairs here. But when you think about it, signs, signs point us to something beyond themselves, kind of like road signs, road signs, uh, certain signs, they alert us to something that lies ahead. And the sign of Jesus changing water into wine at the Cana wedding, it points us to something far more valuable than the wine itself, as fine as that wine might have been. It points us to the source of all life and joy, which is Jesus himself. The image of a wedding banquet and fine wine, it's not uncommon in the scriptures. In most cases, this imagery was used to communicate restoration that would come with better days. And this imagery was used as a sign, a symbol of joy and celebration associated with salvation, deliverance from trying or awful circumstances into better days. The prophet Amos, he said this in chapter 9, verse 13, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows seeds. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. And then Isaiah, he uses a similar imagery as well when he said this in, verse, in chapter 25, verse 6. And in this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of well-refined wines on the lees. In each instance, the imagery of the abundance of fine wine is a symbol of the abundance of joy that awaits for those who are in desperate times, hard times. A day of salvation awaits all people, and Jesus' extravagant miracle of changing water into wine is a sign that in him, life, joy, and salvation are here. They've arrived because Jesus arrived. He came to the world to give life so that all may have life and have it abundantly. Better days. And this abundant life is more than mere existence and survival. The abundant life that Jesus gives is to know and to be known by the one through whom all life is coming to being. It is to have an intimate relationship with the one who loves us so much that he will never stay away from us. And he will always continue to give us the kind of life depicted by the abundance of fine wine in this story in John chapter 2. Abundant life is better days. It doesn't mean ease and comfort, it can be that, but abundant life, better days can be experienced even in the absence of ease and comfort. And what it means is that we have an extravagant source of grace to sustain us now, regardless of the era or the time or the crisis that may exist around us. Grace that is far more sufficient to provide where we fall short and, and also to give us joy amid sorrow and suffering. Abundant life, means that in Christ, we are joined to the source of true life, life that is rich and full and eternal, life that neither sorrow or suffering or even death itself can destroy. So, let's not keep silent. Live out the joy of the Lord that has been given to you. No fear can get in the way. It's ours. Abundant life equals better days. Better days that we can have even now regardless the circumstances, regardless the era, even now. Abundant life equals better days. Go in peace and serve the Lord.
God, how great Thou. 